Hi everyone, this is Koichiro Ito. I'm an associate professor at Harris School. Um, so today I'm going to talk about a little bit about my research and also um, energy and environmental economics track for our PhD program. I'm an economist uh, working on a variety of issues in environmental and energy economics. And uh, I'm not the only one at, at, the, uh, at Harris School uh, working on this area. So we have actually a bunch of great faculty members, including Michael Greenstone, uh, Ryan Kellogg, uh, Fiona Barlig, uh, A.R. Frank, and Amir Jinnar, and Shaoda Wang. Um, so I'm gonna talk about each person's kind of expertise, um, but uh, let me start with mine first. I am uh, broadly interested in many issues, um, but recently I had a project in China uh, looking at how much uh, people are willing to pay for clean air. And this is probably a good example for my work how, uh, about how I proceed my research project. So let me briefly talk about this project. So um, several years ago, my co-author, Xuan Zhang, um, at uh, University of um, Colorado Boulder right now. Uh, she and I were doing a post postdoc at Stanford. And back in 2012, uh, we thought about uh, air pollution in China was getting really serious. And we wanted to understand how, what is a willingness to pay among the usual Chinese people about mitigating this air pollution. Because in environmental economics, we think about there's a cost of uh, regulating air pollution. So we always want to think about the benefit of regulating air pollution or other pollution. And one of the measurements we can think about is the willingness to pay. But the, difficult, uh, the difficulty here is we don't have any market for clean air. So uh, one traditional approach is based on stated preference. So you can actually go to China and ask households to, uh, to think, uh, to ask uh, their stated preference, so how much would you um, want to pay uh, for getting clean air, okay? But uh, traditionally, this type of stated preference approach has uh, a lot of challenges and mainly because uh, many times what people say could be very different from what people actually uh, think in their mind. So uh, kind of in environmental economics, we shifted uh, to the reviewed preference approach. So we want to understand we need to pay based on some economic activities um, and we want to see it from the data. So uh, that's a probably uh, that's been a shift uh, in the last 10 or 20 years. Uh, of course, there is still a research question that can be answered only by stated preference approach. So we still do surveys and other things. So that's very important. My approach usually tries to think about reviewed preference. So in this case, um, my co-author and I thought about, first we thought about housing market. So if we look at the housing prices in China and uh, correlated with air pollution, maybe we can uh, learn something about willingness to pay because uh, usually in the US, for example, Michael Greenstone has been working on this kind of project a lot. Um, we can look at housing prices in the US, uh, thinking about some exogenous variation in air pollution or other type of pollution. And if people care about pollution, then we would think housing price for that region uh, could be lower than other region, almost equivalent, but uh, air pollution is uh, much better, okay? So that's the usual approach uh, from um, what we call a hedonic uh, approach. Um, however, the problem uh, we noticed back in 2012 was uh, in China, um, migration is really restricted. So housing market in a sense is not completely um, uh, kind of free market. Everyone can purchase anywhere. That's not true in China. Uh, 
So usual hedonic approach might be very challenging to apply uh, in the Chinese situation. So I thought about alternatives and we heard that uh, many Chinese households started to use air purifier machines at home. So in the US, you can actually also purchase air purifier machines. Uh, if you go to Best Buy and somewhere else, you can actually see it. So it's a, it's a kind of device you can buy and then you put at home to clean your air. And what we found was uh, there's a special function called HEPA, so HEPA filter. That's gonna actually kill 99% of tiny, tiny um, uh, particles. So we usually care about PM10 or PM2.5. So those particles are almost completely killed uh, if you have a preferred machines at home. And this is, has been getting pretty popular in China. So I thought about probably air purifier markets can be useful to learn about willingness to pay for clean air. And my co-author and I tried to get data. It took probably two years uh, or three years to actually get data, so long time process. But what we got was uh, pretty good data in uh, kind of for China. So we obtained scanner data. So like if you go to store and purchase something, you use the barcode and uh, that data goes to uh, some database. So in China, we have the scanner data about air purifier purchases and prices and also product attributes. And we see it monthly and also at monthly by store. So think about you know Chicago Best Buy, Lincoln Park branch uh, this month, particular products, quantity and price and also attributes. So that what we have in the data for China covering major, most of the major cities nationally uh, about, uh, about 10 years, a little bit fewer than 10 years of the data we got. So we have this data for each air purifier's quantity and price. And then we try to look for uh, exogenous variation in air pollution. And we use some kind of natural experiment um, caused by uh, Chinese policy. So we use that variation to implement our estimation. So whenever I kind of try to uh, do my project, I usually start with question and economic theory to understand or answer the question, and then think about empirical estimation approach to test the theory. In this case, we uh, think about typical IO approach, industrial organization approach, uh, using random utility model for uh, consumers' purchase of air purifiers. We write down the model and then uh, connect random utility function to uh, market level demand for air purifier machines. And then we connect this model to the data to estimate, um, demand is, uh, de estimate the demand. So this is very classic uh, traditional uh, IO approach, what we call uh, demand estimation for differentiated products. And then, but our innovation is uh, we connect this typical model to the environmental preferences. So we think about if people have certain preferences for air pollution or cleaning up the air pollution, and then uh, we also can see the price they pay for their prefire machine, right? So we can see their action for the environmental um, preference and also preference for paying less price. So those two parameters in the estimation are gonna be key to define a marginal willingness to pay for clean air. So we use this approach based on the data we collect, collected and then estimated and found um, Chinese households on average are willing to pay $1.34 per uh, PM10 unit per year. Okay, so if it's like a 20, units, uh, then that's gonna be 20 times $1.34 per household per year. 
Um, so that's how we estimated we need to pay. So why is this important? So again, coming back to my first point, whenever we think about environmental policy, um, we think about regulation, regulating, for example, uh, power plants or, um, or transportation, and then that creates cost. However, that's also gonna create benefit. And our willingness to pay measure is gonna be helpful to think about the benefit. So we can use the benefit measure to evaluate uh, environmental policies. Okay, so we do it in the paper. And also we suggested uh, other people who want to evaluate any environmental policies in China, they can use our number. Okay, so this paper um, is going to be published soon at uh, JPE. And a um, very good kind of example of my work, I usually start with question I wanna answer, and then think about the data uh, that can be helpful to answer the question, and also theory behind uh, that could be also helpful to answer a uh, question. So kind of connect economic theory to data, estimate it, and make some policy relevant um, implications. I work on uh, air pollutions in China, and then um, a lot of work in electricity sector consumers, producers, and recently I work uh, some questions in India, uh, Chile, uh, so many places. Okay, so that's, that's how I would describe my research. I wanna talk about um, what is our new energy and environmental economics track in our PhD program. And I wanna emphasize why it's actually awesome uh, and you should come uh, if you really wanna do energy environmental economics research. Okay, so first of all, uh, we have a great line of faculty members who committed to the PhD program education uh, to educate and also place uh, to the you know, market um, our uh, PhD students. So um, we have Michael Greenstone, who probably you might heard about, uh, who works in a variety of areas in energy and environmental economics, including recently uh, many work in India, uh, thinking about the pollution in India, uh, China, and also uh, recently uh, working a lot of projects on climate change and estimate um, uh, cost of you know, carbon um, and a variety of things. Okay, so he's a, a great person to have. And then we have Ryan Kellogg, uh, who works a lot on uh, oil and uh, gas industries and he's, who is actually used to work on this area before he comes to the academic, so he knows uh, a lot about institutional details and also wrote a uh, rights group at great papers. Uh, so uh, Ryan is a great person to have. And then we have um, four junior faculty members as well. Um, so Fiona Berlick, uh, she works on a kind of intersection of environmental energy economics and development. Uh, many work in India and some work actually in California. This is not development, but agricultural sectors in California. Uh, so she's also a great person to have for potential advisor. And uh, A.L. Frank, uh, he is also very different from us, which is great. Uh, he works in a very emerging area, kind of between environmental economics and ecology side. So he, knows a lot about uh, you know, ecology and, um, and other fields, kind of to integrate it to, uh, with economics uh, to make very interesting and uh, unique research projects uh, that, cannot, that have not been uh, answered before. We have Amir Gina, who also is an expert in climate change and also kind of economics of disasters. Um, he has papers on hurricanes in Asia, very interesting paper, and also um, recent papers looking at um, 
uh, climate change, especially focusing on uh, potential uh, kind of you know potential mitigation um, effects. Um, so very very good person to have. And then finally, we're gonna have Xiaodo Wang, uh, who is an expert in Chinese economy, political economy, and environmental economics. And uh, he kind of tackles questions in the intersection of political economy and environmental economics. So I think I wanna emphasize first point, this is a great set of faculty members you can have, and we committed to um, educate and advise our students from the beginning to the end. The end is of job market and beginning is a first year. So in the, even in the first year, in the environmental energy economics track, uh, students are gonna have research op opportunities uh, to work with one of us to have research ex uh, assistant opportunities in the first year. So we emphasize you know, studying to think about research is important for PhD programs. Um, and in the first year, also, our students take coursework from Harris, but also from Ecom. So mainly um, microeconomics and econometrics, um, both from Econ and Harris. Um, so essentially, the, in terms of coursework, very much uh, our students are going to be similar to economics PhD students, uh, thinking about microeconomics and econometrics uh, kind of training in the first year. And second, yeah, this is also another, maybe second uh, unique point I wanna emphasize for our track. We have three quarter um, coursework in environmental and energy economics. So Michael Greenstone teaches the first, Brian Kellogg teaches the second, and I teach the third. So each of us teach a variety of topics in energy environmental economics to try to push our students to the frontier of the current research. So this is important for PhD students in the second year. Kind of first year is just the coursework, micro econometrics and macro maybe. Um, that's like a very basic, but that is very similar across universities whenever you go. However, the second year coursework is very different uh, to my opinion, to my knowledge. Um, some places actually don't have field course in certain field. And environmental and energy is also kind of emerging new field. So some schools have it, but some schools don't. We do have three quarter, um, you know, um, sequence that covers a lot of topics. And uh, one of uh, each of us is an expert in those topics. So uh, we are confident that we can push our students to the frontier in the second year so that students can write a paper right after or in the second year uh, thinking about what will be the new uh, novel and research question in this area okay finally uh, as i said we also think about advising very seriously so from first year we continuously advise our students but also especially you know after the second year coursework we try to advise, uh, we're gonna try to advise our students very um, frequently and also as a team. So our hope is we can uh, advise our students to write a, uh, top rated papers and then um, great job market paper uh, in, in the end. And we're gonna try our best to push our students to the job market to obtain uh, exciting jobs in the end, okay? So overall, uh, I think uh, energy and environmental economics itself is a very important, exciting, and uh, to be honest, it's a lot of you know uh, enjoyable um, field to work on, and uh, also you know kind of important in the future. So I I think it's a great field to work on, and we have a great team to support you. So I hope you can join us uh, to do some impressive work in this area. So if you have any more questions, I'm happy to answer by email or phone call. So feel free to let me know. Okay, okay. So have a good day. Uh, thank you so much for your time.